I'm going to talk a little bit about informal learning. Um, but the title of this session is Formal and Informal Learning in Multicultural Contexts. So I would like to start by... How do I point this? How does it work? It's not working. Yes, the other one. I don't understand it. <laughs> Anyhow, multicultural <coughs> is. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? There we are, multicultural. <laughs> Let's think a little for a second about multicultural learning, right? That's a multicultural situation. Do you all know Pokemon? Yes. Yeah. It's very colourful, it looks very exciting. When we bring multicultural perspectives into our classrooms, very often it's kind of like tourism. We talk about what they eat, what they wear, the hats they wear, the things they say, their expressions, but we don't go much deeper. And I think we need to think, before we start, why do we wish to do multicultural perspectives and so on in learning? I think that uh, I will learn how to do this in the end. There we are. I think that the question of why we use a multicultural approach in our learning ought to be about critical perspectives. Bringing another perspective, another culture, into your classroom helps you to think outside the box, to think outside your own set of cultural understandings, your own set of uh, preconceptions, prejudices perhaps, etc. So what it does is bring a critical perspective into the classroom. And I'd like to relate that to the classroom in general, thinking about boxes Here's a box. That's a Victorian prison in the south of England. It's a box. This is a box. Classrooms are boxes. Formal learning is a box. Thinking outside the box, what's outside the box of formal learning? Informal learning. And informal learning is free. Like water, it flows. It's wonderful. We can do whatever we want in informal learning. It emerges, it's serendipitous, it's magical, it's marvellous. <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and if we continue, we continue with the metaphor of water, informal learning, learning is like an iceberg. What we see here is the formal part of the learning, 10% or so, maybe 20. The experts differ. But the rest, the informal stuff, is under the water. It's not identified, it's <coughs> implicit, we don't recognize it, but it forms an enormous part, and a substantial, important part, of what goes on in our learning lives. So, one would think, we ought to do something about that. We need to identify it, we need to measure it perhaps, we need to assess it, we need to manage it perhaps, facilitate it. Sounds really good, doesn't it? Like, it sounds like we've really hit on something. But I always wonder in education when we come up with some great new idea. You know this story? Yeah. It's what, what used to us is the idea of formal, informal learning. Because basically what we're saying is there is formal learning and then all the rest is informal learning. Let's put all of that into this box that we're calling informal learning. And maybe we're just creating another box. So how do we think outside that box? I want to unpack what goes on a little. I have a friend called Blanca who lives in Monterrey in Mexico. Her son goes to the, the tech at Monterrey. And she, was, she posted on her blog just last week, that's why I'm commenting on it, um, about how when her son was about 16, he was starting the Bachillerato Internacional at the Tech, um, she, wasn't very con she wasn't very convinced that, that that was right for him. And she wanted to take him out. And he said, no, Mom, I'm learning loads and loads and loads of things. I'm learning how to be social, I'm learning how to use video, I'm learning all sorts of things, but you're not learning anything in the curriculum. 
because it doesn't matter, Mum. I don't want to leave my friends. Which is fine. But he did fine. And now the stuff he learned there, though it wasn't curricular, is serving him well. It's useful in his career. So the learning that went on in that far more context was actually emergent, unexpected, unanticipated, fits in the box of informal, but it took place in a formal environment. So how do we deal with that? This term serendipity is used a lot when we talk about informal learning. Serendipity being accidental, stuff that just happens by chance, by luck, etc. And very often, sort of the extreme end of informal learning is called serendipitous. It just happens. We don't plan it. But in fact, a lot of what we do is semi-serendipitous. My friend Blanca is in a, is in a group called Trau, which is a bit like a Simu. It's a loose group of people who are interested in the concept of the personal learning environment, called APA in Spanish. And uh, what we are doing is to explore together our personal learning environments week by week. We have a semi-structured process, we have a sort of an agenda and various times where we meet synchronously, we all converse on our blogs. And so stuff happens, we learn stuff. We don't, know, we don't plan it, but we've created a space where serendipitous learning can take place. So perhaps you can call that semi-serendipitous. I have another group of friends who I meet about twice a year in Brussels when we go there to work together. They're just friends, we go out to dinner together. But just this weekend we were talking about how every time we go out to dinner we learn stuff. And actually that now most of us are looking forward to going out to dinner together because we learn stuff when we're together. We don't know what we're going to learn, but we know we're going to learn. Again, that's informal learning. But how do we get all those episodes and all the other kinds of things that are called informal learning. Do we get any further if we just call it informal learning? How do we unpack this? How do we comprehend informal learning? I think one thing that we could use to think about this problem space is the idea of intentionality. And instead of just talking about formal and informal, we talk about to what extent is this particular instance of learning intentional, planned, etc., by the individual, or is it something that just happens, that emerges? And perhaps that degree of planning is a useful way of thinking about it. Similarly, we have control over what we do, our intentions, but also the degree to which others, teachers or peers, may intervene in the process, or control the process, which also happens, is also important. And perhaps we should be thinking more about the degree to which our learning is mediated or not. In other words, to what extent we, intentionally, or others, guide us, help us to navigate that sea of informal learning. And I say navigate because that gives the idea of not putting it back in a box, but navigating on top of it, letting it happen, so to speak which seems to be a more interesting and fruitful metaphor. Anna Sfard, who is an Israeli uh, writer on, on cognitive issues and mathematics, wrote a very interesting article about 15 years ago now, called, um, it was about two metaphors for learning. One of the metaphors was the metaphor of acquisition. Acquisition being what we could construe as traditional learning, i.e. there's a piece of knowledge it's in my head, it's your head. <laughs> and that's what teaching and learning is, that there's this perfectly identifiable set of knowledge that we transmit. Yeah? And so we acquire this knowledge, and that's the metaphor she identifies. Another, perhaps more recently emergent, way of understanding it, she describes as the participation knowledge. Previously you had a series of buns that you eat, you ingest, you learn that way. Here it's a more participative process, where you eat it together, chew over it together, 
and absorb it perhaps simultaneously. So, acquisition and participation. The interesting thing is that she, uh, her title of her piece is not just Two Metaphors for Learning. She calls it On Two Metaphors for Learning and the Dangers of Choosing Just One. The idea being that acquisition and participation coexist. And either one or the other in isolation, well, you may be missing something if you focus in that, in that way. So I would say if we relate this to uh, informal learning, and the, and the problem of informal learning is, first of all, the question is, and that would relate to the metaphor of acquisition, what is it, what items are we learning informally? What is it that we are finding and inspecting? Is he inspecting something? What's this, what's this monkey doing? Think about it for a second. Look at What's he doing? Is he inspecting something? Has he found something? Yeah, asking. He is a reward to this baby termite, I think. You think? Peter termite. Anyway, one thing is the capture, and so to speak, classification perhaps of the learning items that you have. But the second part, the, the participation part, is having conversations about those, about those items of learning, those things that have happened. And it seems to me that both of those need to be co-present when we talk about any kind of mediation of informal learning. And particularly, I think that it needs to be emphasized that conversation is part of the process. Um, because very often we focus on the other part. We focus on annotating, we focus on capturing, we focus on putting it all in a, in a box to look at later. But the important part, and we know it from our own experience in learning that when you really, you really learn something, when you know how to talk about it, and when you've actually discussed it with other people, and you've socialised that knowledge that you've acquired. Yeah? Because that's when you really make it your own. And it's literally that process of conversation and the reflection that they say you might just be thinking. They do that sometimes. Just meditating. Reflecting on what he learned from that time months. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the issue I'm pointing to is that one thing is identifying the item of learning. Another thing is identifying the value of that learning and how it fits in to what you already learned. And that that requires conversations. And conversations can take place anywhere, in schools, in rooms like this, etc. Those are the attributions, that's a reference. And this is a friend of mine from Mexico. <laughs> and for those of you who don't speak Spanish, <laughs> the rough translation would be, all this school screws me up. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Thanks. Now it's time for...